And I will turn it over to Mike Winnick. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction. I'm very excited to be here and to talk to everybody about the food business, the food world, and any of your questions. I, I always find these things work better uh, when I do less of the talking and more listening and answering questions. So I guess it actually gets the heart of what you are all interested in. One thing that I would love, since it's a little more awkward on Zoom to go around individually around the table to kind of introduce ourselves is if you just put into the chat like your name and whatever your specific interest is in food, whether you're an MBA student, you're in the, the food studies program, that way I can kind of get a little bit of your background and then also feel free as I talk to either interrupt or if that's going to be awkward, drop a couple questions in the chat and I will jump right in and try to answer them. So I figured the, the best way to start off maybe is to give a little bit of background on our harvest, how it came to be and how and why I started it and my background before. And then I'd love to take the conversation where it may lead based on your questions. So I started, uh, so starting from the top, I started our harvest in uh, 2013. Uh, we had done our, we did our first delivery in actually July of 2014, July 1st, 2014. And the way I got there was kind of uh, circuitous in that I wasn't a straight uh, food person. I started off what we joke uh, as being on the dark side of the world, although that's definitely not the case. Uh, I was an investment banker actually for eight and a half years. And I was sitting in a meeting with my partners as one does. Um, and they're like, you're going to be partner. And I'm like, no, I'm going to quit to start a food business. And their immediate reaction was, uh, are you on drugs? And I wasn't really on drugs. <laughs> the, the reason I decided to tell them that and to start this was that I woke up every day and I wasn't interested in uh, the next deal, the next like project we were working on. I woke up every day and all I cared about was what I was going to eat, what I was going to cook. And so the question that I kind of asked myself is, is there a way for me to follow what I'm most passionate about, what I most love? And uh, it ended up being quitting to start Air Harvest. And I started the process for Air Harvest a few years actually before I left. And the company I worked at was called Evercore Partners. It was a small investment bank uh, at the time. And now it's much, much larger. Um, so when, when I, the reason I started and the basis for it was, again, I, I actually, being food obsessed was, as one does in October, apple picking with my wife out on the east end of Long Island, uh, visiting different uh, visiting different farms, and had the, the most amazing apples, an amazing day. They were $1.99 a pound. They were super delicious. There were varieties I'd never heard of before. It was like very exciting, right? And then literally the next week, I found myself at the Whole Foods in Union Square, as I'm sure most of the NYU students are very familiar with, and everyone's and not in the pandemic world, but pre-pandemic, and this was really 2012, right? So it was, there weren't Whole Foods born in every street, every corner at that point in New York. And so the like, Union Square was the Whole Foods and it was like packed, everyone's screaming. You're like on the lines with different colors waiting for your turn to be taken. And we finally get home and I bite into one of those apples and the apple literally had zero taste, zero. And I looked at it and it was like covered in wax and it had a sticker on it that said New Zealand. And I was like thinking to myself, like, what is this? Last week, I was at Wickham's Fruit Farm on the North Fork of Long Island and had the most delicious apples. By the way, they were $1.99 a pound, and these are $4 from New Zealand. There is literally no way that Mr. Wickham and Mrs. Wickham are selling all their apples. And so I decided I was going to call uh, Wickham's Fruit Farm. I spoke to Tom Wickham and his wife, and uh, they have been, which I didn't realize at the time, had been far family has been farming that land since the 1640s. It's the longest continuously owned family farm and operated farm uh, in the United States. And so Mr. Wickham and his wife were kind enough to share with me uh, how food gets from farm to table. And they actually, uh, like many, many small family and independent farmers, family farms, they don't have any distribution at all. They sell literally at their farm stand. And for the ones that don't sell just through their farm stand, someone drives a truck up to their farm and says, today, the apples are going to be 10 cents. It doesn't matter what they end up being retailed for or where they're sold. Someone just gives them, say, hey, here's 10 cents. We'll pay you when we pay you. And they give it, they put it on that truck. And five to 10 people, literally five to 10 different businesses between that farm and the customer, like you shop at your Whole Foods, touch that product. And by the time it gets to you, if it hasn't shipped halfway around the world, it's 10 times the price, you know, what the farmer paid. And so the question I immediately asked was, well, what if I drove a truck to you? 
and said, I'm going to sell it directly to the customer for, you know, half of what Whole Foods sells it for, and you'll collect 50% of it. So that we split it evenly, you get multiples what you'd get if you sold it, you know, through the traditional supply chain, if you were able to sell it all and take it from there. And he, he said that I was crazy uh, to do this, but it was something that I was passionate about. I spoke to dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of different farmers, and every single one of them expressed the same, the same thing. And so, and not just, and by the way, not just in produce, but in every category of food, whether that's protein, whether that's small independent food startups making jams or whatever, uh, all the way through uh, fishermen. And so I spent the better part of a year and a half, two years before I quit my job in uh, July of 2013, trying to build these farm relationships and then quit my job formally in 2013 and launched our harvest with our first deliveries on uh, June, uh, July 1st, 2014. And th the most interesting thing is, like Mr. Wickham said, farmers don't trust ex-investment bankers, especially. Uh, and so I only was able to get five farms and 20 SKUs when we launched. Uh, but we found that customers, and by the way, Mr. Wickham was one of them, um, and the farms, the farmers loved it because they got paid quickly. They got paid a lot more than they otherwise would. And the customers loved it because they were getting food that was fresher and more nutritious than ever had before. And even for people shopping in the farmer's markets, relative to that, it's actually convenient. So, you know, I couldn't, when my old job, I couldn't get to a farmer's market because the one year my apartment was between nine and two on Wednesdays. And obviously I was at work and my wife's an architect and she couldn't get there. And so we we're trying to make the farmer's market experience from a consumer perspective to be more convenient and to help the farmers build their businesses and grow their businesses in a way that they never would have been able to do without us. And so that is kind of the, the genesis of, of our harvest. And just to give you a perspective on how we've grown in those years, now we have over 400 to 450 different farmers and producers on our platform and something like 1,500 uh, active uh, SKUs. Uh, and that number will be higher as the season, uh, season the, like the spring and summer seasons come in and our farms start to produce again. So anyway, uh, that is the you know quick our, our harvest story. I would love to uh, hear a little bit more from you guys about some of the questions that you'd like to ask. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in. I can also quickly scan through um, some of the chat. That would be helpful. Uh, but if anyone has a question they want to come off mute, feel free to jump in. Have you seen uh, since we've hunkered down that people have been uh, more conscious about the food that they've been putting in their body over the last 14 months? I, I will tell you that, yes, that, that's true. Although I will say that that has been, I'll, I'll answer it twofold. One, in the seven years we've now, six and a half years we've been delivering, there's never been a greater interest in healthy, clean, what I'd say clean eating. So food that you're comfortable feeding your family, that you're trying to like focus on health, wellness, all of that. That's never been more popular. Um, I would say that at the very beginning of the pandemic, the, the immediate reaction was not what you'd expect, which is let's eat healthy, let's be like clean. It was actually like comfort was like the initial response that we got. So people were like buying like, like potato chips i'm like exaggerating a little bit about potato chips but people want the stuff that like calm them that made them feel more comfortable and then as the pandemic wore on we saw a, a quick shift back into fresh and healthy and healthy living and i think that you kind of saw that transition happen sometime towards the end of last, last summer when i think people realized that we were in, in it for a lot longer than uh, we had originally anticipated back in march I and mean, i think when we were talking to farms when all the restaurants shut down about a year plus ago everyone was like this is going to be a four to six week thing and we'll be out of it. And I think as it dragged on, we got to see a lot more people uh, kind of shift back towards the healthy living aspect of it. So I think from that perspective, I don't, does that answer your question? I hopefully that, that addresses it. But the original reaction was yeah. less healthy and then went back to like super healthy. Yeah, thank you. I have a question and I'm also technically a student, so I'm allowed to jump in here. Um, but I, so I, I used to work at a sustainable seafood distributor and about eight years ago or so, we worked with Good Eggs here in New York when they were still here. Um, and then we're kind of, we're still partnered with them when they closed and it was really disappointing. But I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to what the landscape is in New York City for this type of model. 
um, and maybe explain for other people on the call in a better way than I could, like what how, what good eggs is and how maybe the the model contrasts or compared with yours and like what how you see it necessary to be successful um, when so many other companies struggle with this. Of course. So I think that the landscape in food is in New York is like pretty fascinating in that uh, it is like still driven largely by traditional grocery stores. And this includes like the New York suburbs. So, you know, your Whole Foods of the world in the city, you have like Mercedes, other places in the suburbs, you have Stop and Shop and ShopRite and all these traditional brands. And that's still where the vast majority of people get their groceries. And then in New York, you also have these on the online platforms like Fresh Direct, which obviously is very large and very successful in some ways and struggles in a lot of other ways. Um, and then there are other smaller, very niche uh, players in food that do things like more like farm boxes, where you pay a certain amount of money and get a, you know, a random box of produce delivered each week. And then there are some national players that are kind of breaking into the New York scene a little bit. So the misfits markets and the imperfect foods of the world. And to just talk a little bit about how, how we're different, and I think the one that most people are most familiar with is probably Fresh Direct. Um, so it might, might make sense to contrast ourselves to Fresh Direct. And by the way, Good Eggs Now, which is only based in San Francisco, they might be in the process of expanding into Los Angeles as well. Uh, they've taken a Fresh Direct approach to the world. Um, so maybe the easiest thing to do is also describe how the typical customer uh, shops. So our harvest tends to target families. Um, they tend to have larger average order sizes, which makes the economics like, much easier. Uh, one, two, uh, the average person, or average family shops for groceries two plus times a week. Once a week, they're shopping for their fresh food. So you're talking about their traditional go to the grocery store, pick up, you know, if they're cooking salmon, they're cooking egg, you know, their eggs, their milk, everything that they want for the week. Once a week, there's like kind of like an oh crap moment where, hey, I'm cooking something and I need an ingredient or I ran out of milk or whatever. And in that case, they run to a convenience store because they need something like really fast and quickly. And then once every, depending upon where you live and how big your you know, storage capacity is, you're going to Costco or to you know, Walmart or in the city. This is how I use Fresh Direct or like paper towels and commodities that don't go bad. And so our harvest has positioned ourselves to take the once a week fresh food pickup, which is the bulk of someone's weekly groceries. We are not going to compete on paper towels or frosted flakes or commodity products. Forget that it doesn't fit with our model and our vision for sustainability um, or you know being eco-friendly, but but rather like fighting Amazon and uh, Walmart and Target and Fresh Direct on uh, you know easily commodity products that can easily undercut on price isn't a great place for someone to compete. And so we've decided and have spent all of our energy over these years to build technology and to build an infrastructure that supports the delivery of food from the farm to the table in 24 hours, 24 to 36 hours. So that's kind of like where our harvest plays. And relative to Fresh Direct, Fresh Direct is, and Good Eggs now, are traditional grocery stores that do delivery. So you go onto their site, they have all the stuff you get in a traditional grocery store, your frosted flakes, your paper towels, your water bottles, probably you also have plenty of fresh, delicious fresh food, some of which claims it's from uh, small family farms, although it's typically from distributors um, and brand, just well branded. Uh, and so they are delivering that product to your door, but it's really just a traditional grocery store wrapped in good branding. And what, what we've done, which is short, extremely different, is that we actually have a supply chain where we buy direct from our farmers. So we are, own our own fleet of logistics and our own supply chain. We bring our trucks, so you place your order, then we place our orders with our farms. We go to the farm with our own trucks. We pick up and then bring that product back to our warehouse. And that same day, that product is going out on a truck to be delivered to you. Um, and so that model is extremely different than everybody else because we're able to, from an economic perspective, capture all the margin uh, between the farm and table versus other places where the distributors are kind of like marking up the product. By the way, Amount, the amount of food loss that happens at each point, the longer food sits, the less nutrition it gets. It's a terrible system for everybody. Um, and so our whole idea is to try to break that mold, break that system, and build something completely uh, unique and different. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a bit of a sense of the current landscape um, in, in New York. And again, there are other smaller players that are out there doing uh, similar type things, but nobody uh, with the breadth and the depth of the products that you know, we're able to offer. And from a consumer perspective, if any of you have been on to our uh, website, 
we are like fresh direct and you can order what you want um, and have it delivered when you want so long as we deliver to your town that day um so we deliver to new york city i think four or five different days a week uh brooklyn two or you know two times a week right now um and so you can kind of like order what you want when you want it so it's a little bit of like a customer gets to choose what they want but they're still getting the very fresh very best food they possibly have money to buy at a price that's not egregious uh, that doesn't mean our price is cheap but our prices are fair relative to whole foods anyway so did that answer your question yeah thanks it was helpful to hear hear about all the systems at play for sure cool i see anila has a her hand raised yes uh, yeah, speaking of fresh direct, so um, I used to be a member of the Park Slope Food Co-op, which doesn't have plastic bags and, you know, like super sustainable work. They work with farms. And um, since the pandemic, I've been doing fresh direct. Um, I also had a baby in that time. So it's just like so much more convenient on a lot of levels. But it kind of kills me every week when I get my delivery. And there is just so much plastic in there. Like my coffee bottle is wrapped in plastic. My apples come in plastic. Um, so I'm wondering how you guys manage the delivery of products and, and think about sustainability of the material, the packaging materials. Yeah. I, I have a great answer to this. And actually Sarah's aunt is here too. And she was in charge of like getting us to be zero plastic. And she had done a fantastic job because right around the beginning of last year, we went from basically like we got, I would say zero plastic. We don't add any plastic. So if a farmer packages something in plastic, there's nothing we really can do about it. Uh, but at, at as of March 15th of last year, we had no plastic. Uh, we had wow. it was all compostable bags, compostable containers. Everything was like, you know, paper bags we use for for our deliveries. Um, so everything was like fairly sustainable, actually extremely sustainable. And then COVID happened, and the people wanted plastic. Um, which is like a very bizarre negative externality of COVID, which is like plastic, like nothing seeps through it. Um, it's completely clean. Um, so anyway, so we have unfortunately um, shifted more towards like being hypersensitive to our customers' desire for like being sanitary. Not that we want, not that, not that compostable isn't sanitary, but it's like there's a different degree of comfort that our customers have. We do anticipate in the near term or like the near medium term going back to being plastic free, but it was like one of our big accomplishments of like 2019 uh, was like getting off plastic. And so uh, the answer is right now, if you were to order, you'd have a lot of plastic and you'd be annoyed. That's the honest answer, but that won't, that won't last forever. Uh, actually, as some of the rules from the, by the way, also like ag and markets and, and F, you know, the, you know, FDA and other like protocols were like use, basically like, what do you call them? Like use plastic. Um, so, you know, but the answer is we're going to be transitioning back. So hopefully within three to six months, as things start to like normalize a bit, we'll be back to where we were uh, at March, March 1st of last, of last year. Uh, but it was, it was, a, it was really um, shockingly challenging to transition off plastic because there isn't for, especially for produce, there isn't a good alternative, a great alternative. Um, compostable bags. If you're a customer, most people get their when they go to their grocery store, they they like feel their avocados or whatever it is. They put them into a plastic bag, bring them home, shove it in the fridge. When you use a compostable bag, the compostable bag breaks down in your fridge. Um, and so we are, when we first transitioned, it actually led to a lot of customer complaints thinking our quality was bad because a day or two after their product would be like a little wet or a little slimy. And the reason is uh, was because the compostable bag starts to break down. And so there was actually, uh, I think, a, a pretty significant learning curve for our customers to get used to uh, alternate uh, packaging. Uh, but it's something that our customers got over and were very excited about. And by the way, our customers were pressing us to do it. Um, so you know, it wasn't just that you know we were you know being we, we that was our mission is to be completely sustainable in every way we can. I mean, like food miles traveled, all that. Like, there's probably no one lower than us out there. Uh, but you know, from from our perspective, we we had made that whole like it's a huge accomplishment and then it was like shot we shot ourselves in the world kind of shot us in the foot and had to transition back but anyway that's the honest the honest answer to like where we are so you got it you'd be mad right now um but know that you, you shouldn't be mad because in the long run we'll be back to where we, where we were even if customers complain yeah I have a question. Thanks, Michael. Um, 
for sharing your story. Um, I find it really inspirational that you took that leap and transitioned um, from what you were doing in your career and then going into the food services. Um, I wanna ask you, just because I'm in a similar situation where I wanna transition into an industry that is passion of mine, but that's not where I come from. Um, how did you decide to make that decision and like kind of make that roadmap from yourself of knowing from the time that you wanted to exit and then knowing that like the calculations of taking such a risk um, what was your process like in knowing that you were able to make that transition happen? Yeah, it was it was really challenging uh, is the first answer. So as you're, whatever you're like stress you're feeling about it, like, by the way, I, I will say it's not just self-imposed stress. Actually, like my my wife was extraordinarily supportive of it. So that was, that was like really helpful. But I will tell you that like my parents, like my family, like my, you know, they're, they're now extraordinarily supportive, but I think everyone kind of, like I said, like the, my, the, my bosses that I work for, like I was going to be partner there. And they're like, they, they, I think everyone thought I was insane. Um, so there's like, there's like that outside family pressure also that I felt um, like Rebecca, like my, my Rebecca is my wife, her, her grandmother, like this is the, literally, the, this is like a direct quote, by the way. So, and then I'll, I'll tell you like how I transitioned, but I feel like, the, like these are the kinds of pressures that are important to like understand. She's like, like, you know, you've worked really hard. You've got this unbelievable place. Like why? Like when my father came over from Russia, like he sold produce in a cart in the, in the Bronx. Like now you're going to go sell produce. Like you have this amazing job. That's literally the quote that I got from my wife's grandmother, like intense, like Jewish guilt trip. Um, and so, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. But it's going to like, I have like a, like a little bit of a different vision, <laughs> vision than just like produce on like the side of the, the cart. Um, but, but, you know, and then, and then by the way, like a month in, we sent her an order and, you know, she wasn't like in a delivery zone at the time and like we brought the food over and they like, literally called like in tears saying like, she's never, she had not tasted a strawberry like that since she was a kid. Uh, and then she, and so she's like, that was like, that was like a month in. It took like five, my parents like six to 12 months to get over it. Um, so anyway, sharing that like little bit of personal, personal background is a really, really hard decision. And the, you know, for me, I was in like a very comfortable place and shockingly, like I actually really liked what I did. I, I wasn't like passionate about it. Like I didn't wake up every day, like jazz to do another deal. Uh, but I did really love the people I worked for and had an incredible experience at the company I was at. So that made it even more, even more challenging because I wasn't bitter. Um, but it also, I think allowed me to think a little bit more clearly about what it is that I wanted to do. And I think for me, so clearly I wanted to do food. I had some ideas and before, uh, quitting, I kind of laid the groundwork. I like, built like a like a full on business plan, and I don't just mean like sitting in Excel and like actually modeling it out because I actually really didn't do that, um, which is like probably a shock to like people from our harvest on the on the phone. But I spent more time is like developing the concept and what it is that I wanted to do. What was the market? Who who are, who's my customer? And I knew my customer because I was my customer, so I, I knew what I wanted in a food experience, and then. I also found out very quickly by talking to farms and spending a ton of time learning the industry that I had a second customer, which is farmers, like always get screwed. Like they, they get no, no, none of the retail price. They, they have to like wake up at two in the morning. They work their butts off and they barely scratch enough to like feed their own families. And so I felt like I had a weird business where I had a customer, like I had like customers that wanted it. I felt like customers wanted it. And I had farms that needed it. So my supply chain was like kind of logical. And so I got very comfortable that there, like the business worked from multiple angles. And then once I got that comfort level and felt that I could actually execute, uh, I made the leap. And it was really, really hard. It was like very, very well thought out. And by the way, I gave like a full year's notice at my company. Um, so like I had a year like while, while I was there, like work on this. And they were very nice and allowed me to kind of do that. And so, you know, it was like, I was working on a like long-term project they wanted me to finish and I was like totally comfortable with it. So I, I didn't rush into it. It was a really long, like hard fought decision. But once I felt like I really had something uh, and it was, you know, it, it was like, I can execute on it. I quit and, and started. I, I would say that, talking to a lot of other and spending a lot of time on other food entrepreneurs, I would say that depending upon like whether the business can be run a little bit initially as a side hustle to test it, that's a much more prudent way to do something. 
Uh, but like something like Air Harvest requires like really complicated logistics and technology. And it was not something that I could start, uh, you know, I could start without dedicating 100% or 150 or whatever of like the hours of normal work week uh, to it. So so that was kind of the, the calculus behind it. It was, it was never for me about like, okay, the economic, like it was less about the economics, like in modeling out like a business plan. It was more about, do I think this business works? And, and by the way, I'll tell you that initially there was not as much consumer demand for online grocery delivery as I would have expected. Online grocery was like one less than like when I started this was like a fraction of a percent of the overall trillion dollar food business, food world and food at home world. It's like 800 billion or something. Um, and so a fraction of a percent of the 800 billion dollar market is still very large, but it was not, it was not meaningful. And I will tell you that uh, over time, it was very slow on the uptake. People have not transitioned, had not transitioned to shopping online for groceries. So that was one thing that I felt like was like, in some ways, disappointing. Um, but, you know, we were able to capture enough people initially to make this like, it was a real business. And we just drove it from there. Is that helpful? For sharing that. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. I think someone else has their hand raised. Uh, Andrew, maybe? That's me. Hi. Um, so I, I recognize a lot of the farms you use from uh, running restaurants, and a lot of them are the similar ones I've used in sourcing. And really, it's, it's exceptional the that you're using. Um, I've seen a lot of these farms literally start. Uh, like Camparoso is one, and I've worked with them since the beginning. I'm wondering, do you run into, uh, or how do you deal with uh, smaller farms sort of coping with scaling and, and growing into models like that can sustain your kind of business? Yep. Now, that, that's literally the, like the special sauce of our harvest, is that our technology and our infrastructure is designed to work with farmers at any scale. Um, so we can take on a farm that could sell us 30 bunches of carrots a week. Or we could take on a farm that could do 3,000. And, and, and the, the reason is that when you go onto our site to shop, we're offering you full traceability back to that farm. And so if a farm tells us, hey, I can only harvest a max of X pounds of something, or I can only harvest 25 bunches, that's all that'll be made available to our customers. So it's, uh, we're able to, in real time, adjust what is available, by the way. Like Campo Rosso is one of our favorite farms. Um, their, their stuff is rid like ridiculously beautiful and ridiculously delicious. Um, they, you know, but like last week when they had a frost, and this is an example of like the, the challenge of doing our business. Like they, there was a frost on Thursday, like they were harvesting Thursday afternoon for our delivery on Friday. And we didn't get like two of our items for Friday. And so those are the types of things from a customer perspective that are a little bit more unique is that, you know, some, in many cases, depending upon the uniqueness of a product, um, you know, we're able to actually solve any issues like that. Cause I could call Norwich Meadows farm or a neighboring farm, like, Hey, do you have X, Y, Z? But a, a smaller farm like Campo Rosso, uh, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, Campo Rosso is this amazing farm. Uh, it would be like not uncommon to find it at like a restaurant like Blue Hill or to see them, uh, you know, in Gramercy Tavern or, you know, Union Square, some of the top restaurants in New York. And uh, they, they specialize in very, very unique esoteric uh, varieties. So they'll grow like what we're called like uh, a gretti. It's like a, an Italian, like, lettuce that or green that looks like grass almost and when you bite it it tastes salty and no one else grows a gretti um and so you know so anyway the, there there are challenges unique challenges to working with small farms like that but it's also i think something that you think that might disappoint our customers but in a lot of ways excites them because they get access to things that only gramercy tavern would get or only dan barber blue hill would get and so we're able to provide our customers with a unique offering that nobody else does um, but there are stressors in doing it but our whole technology and our whole infrastructure it makes it such that we can work with farms like that great thank you very much but that's the headache and the special sauce of what we do anyone else want to jump in uh, mike there's a question in the chat about uh, expansion plans yes uh, so I, I get asked all the time, especially by potential investors. Um, so for us, 
the the goal is to be the winner. Like we joke with the winner, but we want to be like the leader in the local food movement across the country um, eventually. Now, the logical way to grow that isn't by raising a whole bunch of money and going to open up tomorrow in Los Angeles or San Francisco or Seattle or Austin. Uh, the way you do that is to grow sustainably uh, through your existing network of farmers. Um, so our initial goal is to continue to build a uh, share in New York City. By the way, like in the great in the greater New York area. By the way, like you know, if we had one percent market share in New York, we'd be like a multi-billion dollar company. Just to put like the size of the markets in perspective, um, you know, and and in the near term is to continue to expand kind of up in the direction of Boston and down towards the direction of DC. Um, probably closer to Philadelphia, maybe by you know sooner rather than later. But those are the directions like that that we would move and. The reason we want to move logically is our network of 450 farmers, a farm that's in like Albany and upstate New York is equidistant to Boston, a farm in Pennsylvania that we have is equidistant to Philadelphia. And so it's extraordinarily easy for us to use our existing infrastructure and logistics to grow that way. Um, so in terms of how we think about expansion growth, that's kind of kind of how we think about it. But, you know, we're also doing our homework now and building a lot of relationships and a network of farmers in other parts of the country. One, to supplement a little bit of what we offer our customers in the winter months, and two, to have a network of farms that when we're ready to expand from the greater New York area beyond, we have that network of farms already built because it took six or seven years to get that network of farms, right? And so we know that it's something we want to do, and we're building those relationships now in advance of future expansion, uh, but we are not planning on opening up like in LA tomorrow, if that makes sense. Uh, see some more hands raised. I'll jump in. Um, I'm not sure if you've covered this before. I joined eight minutes late, but are you noticing any any kind of change and you know change in terms of trends and consumer habits, especially pertaining to grocery? I mean, CPG and organic is is a different trend altogether. But do you see any change uh, changes given the you know last year COVID impacted? What are the kind of changes that you see in consumer behavior? Yeah, so I actually saw a couple of people in the chat uh, that said they were building like CPG businesses. And so uh, I've seen a lot of dramatic changes in uh, starting up CPG brands uh, over the past 12, 13 months now, 14 months. I don't know. Is it 14 months? Really? Jeez. Um, it's been a long 14 months. Um, so, you know, th there's been a dramatic shift in the way uh, CPG brands go to, go to market and what customers are actually looking for. And I, I talked a little bit about like customers recently, originally wanting more like comfort foods and now going back more towards healthy foods and plant-based and things like that. Um, but, and of course, like organic and all that has like continued, has shifted over like seven years. I've been in business and dramatically moved in that direction. Um, but talking about like CPG startups, especially if you're trying to start one or are interested in, in how that, that business works, it's become tr extraordinarily difficult to get yourself out there. Into the into the you know food world, if you're trying to start a, like a, a product business, and the reason is partly customer behavior, where people are kind of buying what they know. So that's definitely been a bit of a trend. Two, you, you see it on the push side of the business, which is the way grocery stores work is it's a completely uh, it's completely a push model. So farmers grow, then the distributor shows up and buys it, then they sell it to someone who sells it to someone who sells it to the grocery store. It goes on the shelf, and then customers buy it or they don't. If they don't, it gets thrown out. Whereas like, what, what used to happen is if you were a CPG business, you'd produce, you'd like go into grocery stores and you try to like get one to take you on. Maybe you get lucky and get a distributor and get into stores and then you kind of like scale up from there. Uh, what's happened is grocery margins are tight. There's all sorts of weird shortages, which if anyone wants to talk about and ask that question, I'm happy to talk about why there were weird supply chain shortages. But grocery stores have been cutting back on new SKUs and new products. And so customers are getting actually less access to new innovative products than they otherwise or historically would have. And so it's extremely hard to start a, a new food business and get into traditional grocery stores. And so what we've seen is that our harvest can serve as a really awesome platform for food startups to actually launch their products where people can go and taste it and discover new and exciting things that they can't get anymore or wouldn't see at, through traditional grocery. And we actually saw from a trend perspective, some restaurants, that we started working with start selling CPG like products. So they might sell, you know, like, like a jam from their restaurant, or they might sell a hot sauce, or they might sell an entire kit, like a cooked kit of food that we would sell. And so 
you know, we saw that was like an obvious like shift on the supply side because restaurants had all this cooking capacity and didn't have customers. And so anyway, I, I don't know if I really answered your question, but I, I feel like that the the biggest change that I've seen is how grocery stores have cut down new product offerings and how that has caused a lot of stress for smaller food uh, startups trying to like make their name and get out there. And so that's been like the biggest like customer product availability shift that we've seen. And then from a trend perspective, it's every it's organic, plant-based, all of that. I will tell you though, like if you want to pitch our harvest, and that's by the way, like, the most fun part of our job. Um, back when we were all in the office or the warehouse all the time, like Sarah and Carrie could talk to us, like getting samples of the most amazing things was like the most exciting part of what we do. Um, I will tell you though, like everyone is pitching uh, plant-based everything. It has to taste good. Like we are not going to sell something that doesn't taste good. I don't care like how healthy it is. Um, so that's like just quick memo to anyone trying to start a CPG business, like a food product business, like make sure it's delicious before you like, you know, you pitch because someone might order it the first time based on the branding or based on the story, but they're not going to be worth it. Did I give any, did I answer your question at all? You did. And it's very interesting to know all that you're doing. Sorry. It was a really Thank long, you. yeah, it was a really long winded ranting answer, but hopefully that's helpful. Uh, I see some more hands raised. Anyone want to jump in? I'll jump in again. Um, so you mentioned expansion outside of the city, but I, I was looking on the website and see that there's not delivery to my zip code quite yet. Um, Where are you? I'm in Flatbush. And Flatbush. no, I guess not. Um, so I was just wondering how you think about which neighborhoods that you're targeting and if you think at all about um, serving food desert areas. Not that I'm in one, I'm just curious because there are many in New York. Oh, we, we think about that. We think about all that all the time. And we're, we try to be very cautious and careful about making sure that we cover all aspects of like the demographic areas. So just an example, like, I think for our harvest, which is like a little bit different than probably what you'd expect because we're selling premium farms and you know, our prices aren't cheap, obviously. Um, our two best customers, I, I haven't looked at this in a couple of months, but our two best customers historically one was lived on in like a twenty something million dollar apartment on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, and the other one, she's a nurse and her husband's a construction worker in Valley Street, uh, which is like a fairly middle class neighborhood on Long Island. And we're able, you know, based on our pricing and our going direct, able to serve people kind of all over the place. And so it was definitely like a focus of ours to make sure that we we try to serve um, as many communities as we, we possibly can. Um, you know, we're also very mindful, like making sure operationally that our business works. We we haven't been funded by venture capital or anyone. So we try to make sure that the, the economics of our business are sustainable. And one of the challenges in some of the South, like the, I call South or like central deeper parts of Brooklyn is actually, it's very logistically challenging for us to get there from our warehouse without like, like, so, so you're, you're more, our, the answer is more likely to, we're, more, we're, we're not likely to serve a neighborhood where it's challenging logistically or expensive to serve for some reason, rather than specifically focus on the demographics of the communities that we're serving. That's not to say it's not it's not something we, we never think about, but it's definitely not like our number one focus when we're expanding. It's, is there a market for people who want to, you know, buy our stuff? And um, is there a need in that community for people to buy our stuff? Um, and so, you know, we, we think of it more like that and then think about the economics of going into a neighborhood um, rather than uh, anything else. Thanks. And what, what's your zip code, by the way? Because I want to make sure that, that Sarah can... Uh, it's 11226. Okay, 11226. <laughs> Surprise. I, thought you were... I have a follow-up question to that one, um, kind of related to the food desert, uh, food access question. Uh, I just wrapped up a MBA challenge, uh, MBA student competition. Actually, some of the participants are on this call, I believe, um, about growing food in New York City at, in an affordable, accessible, scalable way. A really difficult challenge, of course. Um, so I just wonder, kind of with all the growth in ag tech and urban ag recently, if you could share perspectives that you might have on how to balance priorities of growing our own food in New York City versus bringing in local food from right outside New York City and, and uh, kind of where the solutions lie and what where we should be focusing our efforts. Yeah, so this is the, 
and I'm, I'm blanking on where I, there, there was basically a great conversation that I'll have to try to find it. I can share with you uh, between uh, Kim, Kimball Musk, who's uh, Elon's brother, uh, who uh, is like the lead investor or chairman, I think, of Square Roots, which is an urban farm uh, in New York City. And Dan Barber, who runs Blue Hill and is very focused on sustainable agriculture. They literally like, had like this intense debate about this exact thing. And I'll tell you where I come out, like living in the center of the, the food system, um, which is that it is extremely expensive to grow food in an urban environment. Um, energy costs are, especially, especially in New York, where operating in New York City is really, really extremely expensive from a real estate perspective, from an energy perspective. By the way, like it takes a ton of energy to grow like a pound of lettuce. Like it's a crazy amount of energy, right? Uh, and it's not like we're in Southern California where you could just kind of like put your, you know, they put some glass on the roof and use a greenhouse all year long. Like that doesn't work either because it gets cold and there's no, no sunlight in the middle of like the, you know, the, the winter. So it's very expensive to grow that. It's also extremely challenging to, uh, in indoor environments in New York. And by the way, we've been trying to convince people to do this, um, not just in the city, but in the suburbs to grow things that aren't microgreens or lettuce, because as much as like we, everyone wants lettuce or microgreens, I will tell you the average retail customer, especially in uh, middle income, like some of like our, you know, our more middle class neighborhoods, are not buying like twelve dollar and ninety nine cent for like a tiny container of like rare microgreens, right? And so the the issue you have with urban ag is given you need few things that, that can be cut and regrown really fast and lack and without a lot of energy, right, to make the economics work. So anyway. The answer is it's really hard to make the economics work in indoor ag and to grow things that people actually want to eat consistently. I mean, lettuces are wonderful. I'm not saying there isn't a market for that, but there's only so much like lettuce that one can like sell. And so my gut is that the area would be better off. Uh, this is being reported. So I'm like, it's like, you know, when, when Square Root sees this, they're going like, to yell at me or Gotham Greens or whatever. Um, like, oh, we, we, work with, we work with all these companies and we love them. Uh, but like, I, I think the investments better off made uh, with a lot of these farms who are truly experts in growing, who are truly experts in seed varietals and biodiversity, who know that they can grow an alpine strawberry at, in, in 42 degree temperature, rather than have to grow a strawberry in 85 degree temperature in the middle of New York City. Like, there's all this land that's being completely unused. There are all these malls in the suburbs that are dying that could be used for something like this. There's all this, like, excess land. And so to concentrate a farm in a neighborhood that's really expensive to live in um, doesn't seem like the best use of resources. So I, I would rather see investment, some of this, these investment dollars going and helping some of the farmers right around the corner from us, like right in the suburbs or right in like rural areas right nearby, build some of these uh, greenhouse type systems on their farm where they can grow things beyond just lettuce. And so to me, that, to me, that, and by the way, our farmers are struggling too. It's not like, you know, they're, they would, they would, you know, in many of them, we priced out of some of the things that our harvest would sell, right? Which is like really sad to begin with. So it's not like there's like, you know, there's like huge amount of capital helping these farmers and like they're just selling the product and everything's great. So, you know, my, my instinct is that it'd be better to allocate capital to some of these small family farms that were really awesome, unique things. And then have a logistics system like our harvest that's buying directly from that farm and can bring it in very cheaply to the neighborhoods that need it. I think that would be a much better system. And by the way, like one of the things that our harvest could do or these farms could do is we could price things a little bit differently in a neighborhood that needs a different price than the Upper East Side would have. And so I think that that there's there's I think there's an optimal way to do this. I have a strong opinion on it. Obviously, you all you all heard it. Um, that's not to say that those businesses don't work. I just think it's really hard economically for them to grow really cheap food in New York City at a price that like their neighbors can actually afford. Did that help answer the question? I think that was, I think that was pretty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that that's exactly what we've been struggling with, how to produce something better than like $8 microgreens. Like, and, and the way you do it is requires a huge amount of energy um, right. to do it. And that's really expensive. And so like I, I was talking to uh, one of the indoor, you know, farmers and I'm like, okay, I want you to grow strawberries. Like, I will buy all of your strawberries no matter what you grow. And by the way, in the middle of the winter, I probably could sell them for like $15 a pound or something. And that's egregious. Like that's an egregiously expensive strawberry, right? Nobody can afford that. Like, you know, and so 
I could sell it though. Like I could definitely, there's my customers in like, you know, very fancy neighborhoods who buy it, but that's not like the, the goal, right? I don't think that the goal is like bring out another like $15. There's like this like company that's doing amazing strawberries, like delicious in Jersey. And they're like, like $50 for like each beautiful giant strawberry. It's like, that is not a food system solution. That's a great product for a certain targeted customer. By the way, a high-end chef might want those products, right? But it's not a great retail product. And so I think that it's really important to consider like that, the the broader food system and just like, oh, let's go grow some stuff in the middle of New York. Anyone else? Don't see. Hi, Mike. Oh, and I just raised my hand, but I have a question for you. And so many of the things that you said really resonate with me. I'm also a child of an immigrant, um, and my parents worked in a restaurant, and now I'm in food. So I have the same exact um, reaction from my parents as your dad, too. Um, and what we're trying to do right now, my co-founder and I um, just recently founded a company called Rooted Fair, and we're trying to partner and profit share with immigrant chefs to make sauces. And like something that you said really um, stood out to me is like these restaurants right now are trying to sell jams and hot sauces and kits to customers. And we're trying to champion immigrants to do the same and have those opportunities. And I guess, um, as we're trying to figure out distribution channels, like how do you envision um, our harvest championing championing uh, small businesses and fostering that CPG innovation? It's it's literally what we do for a living. There's like brands that have become like actually quite large successful brands. The first place they ever sold was on our harvest. Um, so like that's this is literally the core of what we do. So if you send your products, like definitely reach out to us um, because we want we want this is like literally what we want to do. And this is what I guess is excited every day. Like I get to try something that I've never had before. Like that's like literally the best thing that can happen to me, right? Hopefully it's delicious, but like I, I love I love that, right? And so this is exactly what we do. We can help brands grow and to scale. And you know, with a lot of startups that come on, you know, we also do provide a lot of advice to them, feedback from, from our customers because we know what customers like. We have you know, we collect all the data on our customers, right? Like what they click, what they look at. And so we're able to tell what they're interested in and can give feedback to our suppliers like, hey. This product isn't working. This product is working. This is why. Why we think, you know, we never know exactly. Um, but so, you know, so we're a pretty valuable resource for for startup. We help people transition just their product offering product lines as they kind of launch. But yeah, we've launched with like every the Haven's Kitchen, which is like now like all across you know, Whole Foods everywhere. Like we're the first person ever to carry it. Um, we were one of the early like adopters of Seed Mill. It's like a teeny company. And they do all of other stuff that's really grown significantly. Um, you know, Slow Gleaney, the pasta company, we were one of the first people ever to sell that. Um, and that company is completely, like, especially over the past, like, six weeks or something, they came out with some, like, new pasta shape. Like, this is literally, this is literally like, like, what we do. Um, so happy to help in any way. Um, you know, just the thing that I'll say that for a small company, we like everything to be, like, above board and done the right way. And so one thing you'll need to think about for the, uh, you know, the business that you're working with it's just making sure they're being produced in a way, you know, and I, I don't know how your, your model is set up, but they're producing a kitchen that can legally sell it. You know, like it's, it's not just like selling your own wares. Like if you're going to sell through our harvest, you need to have like insurance, and all these other things. And so I don't know if like your business is going to be like the central, like if you're going to be like the central player and like you're going to handle all that or whether each of these companies is going to kind of be like independently operated. But that's something definitely to like keep, keep in mind because that part of like how the food system works, it's not complicated. But it's like it it adds like layers of like headache and stress. Like being a like starting a food business sucks um, because there's so many regulations, and I don't just mean like food safety regulations. Like like with very little things that like you don't realize when you're starting. Like like the gloves that our employees have to wear have to be FDA grade. They can't just be like regular gloves, right? When they're like handling food, and that's like three times the price. And so it's like little, like, like these like weird details, and that's like a regulation, right? Because all these like weird little details that you, you need to put up with and deal with when you're a food business, and you know it's not like a high margin, easy to operate business. And so, you know, it's just being mindful of all those little things when you're when you're starting that business that so you're positioned to sell. In terms of uh, you know broader distribution, you know there are like my my recommendation generally would be to start at a place like Air Harvest and then use us as like a springboard to get into some of these. And we can always make introductions 
to you know to some of these smaller distributors that can then hook you up with smaller independent food stores and then you go pitch Whole Foods or whatever. Um, but again, it's really hard these days to get into traditional grocery stores because they're dramatically reducing the SKUs they offer. And because there's not a lot, people aren't spending a lot of time in the store, there's not a lot of opportunities for individual product discovery anymore. Um, you're not allowed to sample, like there's like all these weird COVID rules. So, you know, that's something that hopefully will mitigate. Um, but anyway, there's there's a lot of challenge of starting a similar kind of business, this kind of business. But, you know, exposing people to unique and interesting products is something that I think our customers absolutely love. And I think there's a huge market for it. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing those nuggets. <laughs> no, no problem. And, and uh, it would really be helpful. Just uh, feel free to reach out. Absolutely. Anyone else? I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. I'm trying to see if there are any other questions in the chat. Um, Mike, I know you had mentioned this earlier, but um, if there are any other questions and you want to chat about any food shortages or kind of supplier issues we faced during COVID, that might be um, a compelling area to cover. Yeah. So happy to talk for like a minute or two about that. Uh, you know, you guys know from shopping and living through early March and April that uh, there were all sorts of crazy, weird product shortages. Forget just like toilet paper, which is like obviously like the, the typical one. Uh, but like, I don't think people appreciate how close and in many cases actually did break, how close our food system was to completely collapsing. Um, back in March and April. And I think that, uh, you know, we were very fortunate as a company to not have those issues because we controlled our supply chain. But to put things kind of like more simply, if you think about like that, that chain that I was talking about at the very beginning, which is like farm sells product to distributor, distributor sells product to someone else, who sells product to somebody else. Each one of those people is selling on credit. So a restaurant doesn't have to pay a distributor for 30 to 60 days, by the way. Some distributors offer 90 day terms to restaurants. And so when a restaurant, all the restaurants stop having cash come in, all the restaurants stop paying their distributors and all their distributors stop paying the person that they got their product from all the way back to the farm. And so farmers didn't have enough cash to bring people back into their farm to harvest things. So there were things like dying on the vine. There were farmers that didn't have enough cash to like have their chicken processed at a USDA facility to sell. There were farmers uh, that, uh, you know, literally they, they, they were like basically out of business. Uh, and so the the food system really teetered on like the edge of like completely breaking. And I think that one of the most exciting, interesting things that happened during the pandemic was in terms of the local food system, how quickly uh, farmers were able to pivot their businesses, one, to be a little bit more direct to consumer, but also to sell through people like us. And also how the local food community in New York all banded together to help each other. So, you know, a, a lot of like, a farm like Campo Rosso uh, you know, which we talked about earlier, all these like rare greens, like they're not selling bread tea and, you know, like weird chicories to like retail customers. They are at the for a farmer's market, but they aren't really selling that retail, right? It's a fraction of their business. And when 90 something percent of their business went away overnight, it's like, what the hell do I do with all this stuff that I've already planted? By the way, all the other stuff goes on. So, you know, one of the things that was really amazing is that we saw a lot of our farmers like say, hey, look, this farmer like is struggling right now. Um, they don't have it. They have no customers. Like, can you can you sell their carrots? They're, they're the best carrots. And it's like, but I'm buying, you know, but I'm buying your carrots. So like, don't worry about my carrots. You're buying my peppers. Like, buy carrots from this other farm. And so it was amazing to see, like, in the in the aftermath of like the restaurant shutdown, we were able to add like probably 15 to 20 vendors, like pretty much overnight, at the request of other farms to help save their neighbors. And so it was this like really incredible um, feeling of like we're all working together to like fight for a better food system locally. And I think that a lot of the stressors that were seen in a lot of grocery stores where there were weird shortages and other things, because we all banded together and a lot of people like, you know, we took up that, we took up all that volume that was going to restaurants. I think there was like this sense of we were able to get through this together and it's made the system stronger and more knowledgeable about some of the holes and issues uh, in the system itself. Uh, but it was a real, it was a real challenge, especially for, uh, the distributors who couldn't get any cash in the door. Um, so they all, a lot of them actually did go out of business. And the ones that didn't 
a lot of them pivoted also to direct the consumer to try to survive. Um, and that's always like a mixed bag because when you're used to selling to restaurants and then trying to sell to individuals, it's like a logistical, like completely different animal from like every perspective of the word. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that was an interesting story or not, but that was kind of like a, I think it's actually a good way to, you know, if we're wrapping up, um, it's a good way to end because it was just, it might, it was very, you know, it was great to see people actually working together, try to like help for a common, common cause, as opposed to it just being like a, a free for all of madness as it was. And as we felt like a year ago today, I was like looking like my phone, you know, it gives you like the reminders of what happened a year ago. And like a year ago, I was literally driving a truck in, um, you know, in New York City uh, because it was COVID and we couldn't get anyone to come to work. Um, it was really hard um, to get to get people to come to work, understandably. Uh, and so it was like I was sitting on a deserted tr- on a truck looking down Fifth Avenue, it was totally deserted. And to think that we're you know where we are now and how much progress we've actually made, but also how the food system survived and is resilient uh, is kind of like a heartening thing. So anyway. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, what a full hour of uh, really uh, interesting insights and, and stories shared. So on behalf of all the students in the line and the students who had to jump off for class, good for them. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, looking forward to having you back again soon. And thank you again to Carrie for making this all possible. Yeah, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure.